You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. But we've we've got the bodyguards with us and they shoot this guy in front of me. There's a couple of things we do agree on. And one of them is that our father, right, worked for the Secret Service. So what is Don Pablo Escobar then? He's a pedophile and a rapist, okay? It saddens me to have to admit that because there are people out there who think he's a hero. He's a mass murderer, responsible personally for at least 5,000 personal deaths, blowing up, I don't know what, killing people all over the place, right? Raping young girls. He raped my mother at 12 and a half, 13, and he's got one of these young girls pregnant, and he orders Popeye, his killer, to go out and kill her because he doesn't want any births within the marriage from illegitimate children. 26,000 people there and all the rest of it because he bought all these votes with money. And in a poverty-stricken third world country, which it was really. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Roberto Escobar. Roberto. Hola, hombre, como estas? Hola, brother. <laughs> First of all, we'll promote the book, first book, first born son of Escobar. Yeah. Fascinating read. You've kind of secret son, would we say? Yeah, I mean, I, I really was in denial about it all for a long, long time. You might wonder why I've got an English accent. Well, we'll get into that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I was born Roberto Sendoya Escobar. I'm 100% Colombian. But a set of incredible circumstances <laughs> made me into an Englishman, which is part of my story. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I was in denial for a long, long time. And then it sort of kind of creeped out. And eventually I thought, I've got to just get it out there and write a book. Yeah. Like I say, like, Escobar's son, mum was killed in a shootout, raised by an MI6 agent. Yeah. English accent. Yeah. But people are probably thinking you're going to sound like Scarface. Or, <laughs> but fascinating story. This is your story. But before we get into all the madness, I always like to go back to the start of my guests. Where you grew up and how it all began. Right. Well, um, well what's quite interesting is that um, to answer your question, obviously, I, ha I have to tell you a bit about the story. So, you know, I when I was a very young boy, um, you know, I mean, I'm talking about, you know, seven or eight months Old. I, um, I, even now I remember having dreadful nightmares. I couldn't sleep. Um, I slept, walked, um, constant headaches. You know, I was not a, a well or happy little baby. And as I grew up and as I was older, I kept asking my adopted father, who we'll get into later, um, why I had all these problems. Of course, eventually, he, he, you know, I broke through the shell and he, he told me the truth about my beginnings. Were you in school? So um, before school, um, I, um, you know, I was actually born to a young girl called Maria Luisa Sendoya, which is why I've got Roberto Sendoya in my name. Oh. And um, she's 13. And, my, and, and her boyfriend is a young hoodlum called Pablo Emilio Escobar Gavira. Just a young hoodlum. He's 16. They're shacked up in this place. And he's just a robber, basically a thief, running around in a little gang. And that's all it is. And they have this little baby. And life gets much more complicated quite quickly. So that's how it all began. And it, it began in a little village outside Bogota City, in between Bogota and Medellin. And it's a little village of no consequence in its day. It's got bigger now, as everything does. But in its day, it was a little village of no consequence. And, and, uh, and the incredible story that is my life and uh, was my life back then started then in that little village in 1965. What age was your mum killed? So um, I don't know exactly how old she was, but she was 14 and something. Yeah, and it, this this goes back to part of the story about my real father. I mean, he had a penchant for young girls, even at, at that age. But I mean, it's not uncommon for young girls at 14, 15, 14, 13 to get pregnant. I mean, it's just a, it's just not as an amazing thing. It's, it's quite common, and mm -hmm. it was then, and it still is today. So who raised you? 
Well, you know, every question you ask has a massive answer. Um, so <laughs> it, it, I have to kind of go forwards and then go back flash forth. back, yeah, yeah. yeah, if you don't mind, yeah, of course, because man. it's the only way I can sort of explain yeah. it. So basically, um, you know, I have this kind of life that's unusual, but I think it's normal, which we'll get into. But later when I'm older as an adult, I start asking all these questions, and that's how I know the answers to your questions, because I get told later all about this stuff. So it's not like I remembered everything as a baby, otherwise people think it's, it's just crap. There's no way you can remember all that. And that's true. You have flashbacks. And I had flashbacks and things like that. And, and I, you know, I asked these questions time and time again. And eventually the answers start coming back. So who raised me? So I have to take you back to 1965. But, but I have to take you back a bit further than that. So I have to take you back to 1959. So, um, I don't know if you're ready for this. Are you ready? I'm ready. In 1959, a six foot four Englishman, right, in a Savile Row suit, is walking down Regent Street. How do I know all this stuff? Because he told me. Okay. And he goes into an office, 86 Regent Street, which is now a shop, which is sad. But in those days, it was the head office of Thomas De La Rue. At Thomas De La Rue, a security firm. They do printing, they print banknotes, the great history behind Thomas De La Rue. And um, the other thing that Thomas De La Rue do is they employ high-ranking members of MI6, which is quite well known. Uh, you don't have to take my word for it. And um, so he's, he's going in there, he's a policeman, and he's going into this office to be told in 1959 that he's no longer going to be a police officer. He's now going to be working for De La Rue as a managing director of a new company that they're forming called Security Express. And uh, you know when you get your, uh, you, you order something on Amazon and, and it's brought to your house by a, a, a van? Of a driver. Okay, yeah. So that originally was called a courier service. Okay. Now the courier service originally came from Wells Fargo. Do you know in the John Wayne movies where they like uh, they've got this wagon and they've got this box of money on the top and they're <coughs> whipping the horses and <coughs> and they're getting chased by the robbers and all that. Okay. Oh, quite often in these movies, if you look carefully, on the side of the wagon it says Welsh Fargo, which is an American firm that became an armored car firm, and they transport money. So in the old days, they used to transport money and people across the plains and, you know, the guy would be riding shotgun and, you know. So some of the movies are actually quite real too, true. But, but so, um, so he was employed by Thomas De La Rue to set up the Welsh Fargo equivalent called a new company called Security Express. And this guy's name was Patrick Philip Whitcomb. Okay, and he's from Hull. His father was um, a tailor in Hull and his mother was an Irish woman from i don't know much about his mother but anyway that was it and he was from hull and he he, he was evacuated during the war um to devon a farm he lived in devon on a farm with a lot of other kids as normal in those days and then he went to join the raf and then he joined the police force and then he got recruited into the all this business so basically i've caught that very short because that's a whole another story and i haven't written a book about that yet but um the fact is that we've got to a stage where this guy, right, this Englishman, is now being recruited into De La Rue with a job, which is to set up an armored car service, okay? And he gets this idea, because in those days, there was no electronic banking. In those days, banks would owe each other money, and every two weeks, they would pay each other back. And an armored car would transport the cash from one bank to another, and the debts were paid. And that's how the banking system operated for a long time before electronic transfers and all sort of other nonsense went on. So there was a lot of money being carried about and a lot of promissory notes going on. So there's RWADs and RWAs ready, willing and able to deliver documents with secret codes on them for the banks. And these documents had to be delivered to the banks. And so dad, as I call him, my adopted father, Pat Whitcomb invented this idea where, you know, um, the bank would employ a company to transport in a van these documents safely. So they'd be in like in little packets and the guy would come up to the reception, you'd sign for it. So this was a new idea then, right? This was called a courier service. Of course, it's blown up into a massive proportion now where everything's delivered by courier. We don't even call them couriers anymore. They're delivery drivers, aren't they? Whatever. But they were called couriers. And so he sort of came up with that idea. 
I wish he'd um, patented it because he would have been one of the richest guys alive. <laughs> and uh, But then they wouldn't have gone to Columbia and they wouldn't have found me. So perhaps a good mm. idea they didn't. How did he find you? Yeah, so um, yeah, I'm getting to that. But, you know, it is a long story. <laughs> uh, everything about my life is in here, you see. It's, uh -huh. in, it's I it's don't cool. have to refer to it in any documents or anything. Uh -huh. It's all in my brain. Uh, you can fact check all this. It's not an issue for me at all. Uh -huh. um, I will make slight mistakes because I'm just recalling my life. So, you know, just bear with me on that. Uh -huh. But so to answer your question, what was the question again? How did they find you? So he gets to the office in Regent Street, upstairs, bang, bang, bang. And he goes into this office, and there's a woman typing there, and he goes into this padded, padded door, right, office. And I tell the story like this because it's important that you understand. The guy the other side of the door, right, is a guy called Arthur Norman, who later becomes Sir Arthur Norman, Sir Arthur. And Arthur Norman turns out to be an MI6 agent who is um, head of Thomas de la Rue, and he becomes my adopted father's handler. And my adopted father is recruited into MI6 um, uh, as an operative. And it turns out that Arthur Norman knew during the war in the Far East a guy called Ian Fleming, so that might ring a bell. And the Regent Street office is very much like the office in Dr. No, where he comes in, throws a hat on, you know, and all this money, pennies, you know. So they take the sort of idea from there. Um, and not the whole of Bond's story is taken from that idea, but and so there are lots of other. Uh, but this idea of the office and that is taken from that. And Arthur Norman and, and, and Ian Fleming did all sorts of, I don't know what they were doing out in the Far East. Anyway, so I am answering your question. So what happens is he, he gets sent to this place, the other side of the world, to find out what's going on with um, the Colombian government and something or other. They're not quite sure yet. But they've been asked by a guy called Gregorio Bautista, who is one of the sort of kingpin businessmen in, in, in the area in the, in the 50s, in Colombia, in Bogota. So, um, so basically, I'm explaining to you a bit about Bogota and Colombia first. So Colombia is the size of France and Spain put together. It's a huge country. But more interesting than that is it has a huge height differential. So you've got 9,000 feet above sea level, the capital, and then you've got coast level. Right, and in between these cities and towns, um, thousands of miles of forest rainforest in in this is in the 50s so the government in bogota can't control what's going on you know a thousand miles away uh, through rainforest in in a, in a place called barranquilla there's just there's no control so you end up with feudalism which is what you had in england you end up with a lord in each city who runs it and pays homage to the you know you end up with that system because there's no central control as such. You just have lords in each area who kind of, you know, provide and pay homage, and eventually you get problems with this. So Colombia was in a perpetual state of civil war at the time. And you had a lot of these sort of... Uh, 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 area controllers who, who had their own private armies. A A M M19 is one of the most famous private armies, still in existence today. They call it the FARC, I think. Mm -hmm. I don't know why they call it that. F-A-R-C. Anyway, um, so you've got a situation where Colombia is in a serious problem and the central government are trying to create a country, but it's not a proper country as we know countries today. Um, and, you, you, you know, if there's a problem, you can't just pick up the phone and call the police. You know, it's not a proper country as a whole country. Um, so it's a war zone. Um, and the upper classes of the country are trying to establish what we now recognize as a country. And they can't do that without full control of the monetary systems of the country. So you've got to have banks and you've got to have, you know, monetary systems. So people, uh, up until then, it was all a bit sort of bandido country, you know, bandidos. So uh, there's a situation which needs to be rectified. And the, the, the upper echelons of, of, of Colombian society recognize this. And they call in Tom Stillarue, famous for banknote printing and experts in banknotes and all the rest of it and all that dodgy paper that can't be forged and all this stuff, right? They call these people in to go and set up the, um, the, the, the business and help the Banco de Bogota control the monetary system. Great idea. It was the right, right move for the Colombian government at the time. Um, 
Now, th because of the Civil War and all the murders and the killings and all the goings on out there, um, they eventually come to an agreement uh, and, and, uh, uh, where they will then decide every four or five years who would be president of Colombia uh, so that there's no more war. So, like, if, if you're my enemy, I'd say, right, well, you know, you can, you can decide who will be president of Colombia for the next four years, and then we'll, we'll decide in a few years. So you had this sort of situation, and you had mock elections to make the public think it was all democracy. And there was this agreement uh, going on. sounds a bit like doing a UK in America. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it was designed to stop the killing or the civil war. And it, it sort of worked in a way. Um, but there were uprisings and all sorts of problems. And Colombia's still got problems today. But anyway, so we got a situation where now we've got professionals coming out from London on the BO, uh, BOAC uh, 7 through 707 out to Colombia. And he's going to come up and set up this business. Anyway, turns out that MI6 have realized that this is a great idea to um, also infiltrate the... Um, the, the bandit or uh, money laundering and the what have you operations that are all going on under undercover out there that the government can't control. Um, there is a massive problem beginning to happen, and that is there's a lot of, and it's not the cocaine that we recognize today. There's a lot of, I mean, it all started with with hashish and 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 that and you know that kind of stuff, and also contrabands of other types um, going to America. Because, uh, you know, the Americans were all getting into this hippie stuff, California, Beach Boys, it was all going on, you know, the 60s, and it was like, hey, man. So they, were, they all needed these drugs, right? So these drugs were coming from a place called Colombia, whereas perfect cocoa leaf growing country, you see. Uh, but they hadn't really invented a system. You can't just put a whole load of leaves in a bag. Uh, so they, they had this sort of um, stuff you could smoke. And so the, 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 the local drug lords of their lords, they weren't drug lords, they were lords of their manor, if you like. So today would be like um, uh, a baron or something like that who controlled an area in, in, in Birmingham or something. Or I don't know, you know. Um, but you have that situation in Colombia back in the, in the late 50s. And this, does, uh, this answers the question. No, but, just keep going. Um, uh, uh, um, and so what happens is, is that the C CIA operation in Colombia starts, and it's called Operation Durazno. Uh, uh, and um, it's run by a chap called Manuel Noriega, who works for the CIA. And he's a Panamanian of no real consequence publicly at the moment. Later on, we've, he becomes president of Panama. Um, but at the moment, he is a CIA operative, and they're having a lot of trouble with money that's not coming back to America. So, for example, when you go abroad on holiday, you take your dollars or whatever, and, you know, you go to your travel agent, you take these dollars. You take those, and, you know, eventually those, those notes find their way back to the country of origin. That wasn't happening in this case. <laughs> these notes are disappearing. And so if you start printing more notes to supplement the ones you've lost, you, you default, your currency becomes less valuable. So you can't do that. So there was quite a serious problem. There's like hundreds of millions of dollars disappearing into the system. I don't know where it was going. So they didn't know. So they had to find out what's going on. So it turns out that the, the printing of the, the, the bank notes in Colombia, which was being done sort of a bit ad hoc by the Banco de Bogota, is now being printed by... Um, Thomas De La Rue. So they go down, you know, Pat Whitcomb goes down there, meets all the people. It's all in my book. And um, so he goes and meets the American guy down there and so on. And so they set up this business in 1959, the very beginnings, and they need a local lawyer uh, to do all the paperwork and all his usual stuff. And this local lawyer is called Carlos Escobar. Now you might recognize the name. Right, he's much older than the famous Pablo Escobar. He's uh, he's much older, um, but you know he's there and he's their lawyer. Uh, sorry, he's their accountant. Forgotten mistake. He's their accountant and their accountant and their lawyer, uh, Echeverri Carlos Echeverri, who is a very famous lawyer because Echeverri was also the uh, Colombian representative at the United Nations. And he was also, um, he had quite a few very senior positions in Colombia. Um, so he was a big shot in Colombia. And uh, Echeverri is also on, listed as one of the witnesses on my adoption papers, which is very interesting. Echeverri was also very friends with JFK. So we're talking about the top people in the world at the time. 
And the top company with security printing experience is Delarue. Uh, and Delarue are now in Colombia, and they're about to set up a huge printing operation to print Colombian banknotes for the Colombian government. So you can imagine now, whoever's managing director of Thomas Delarue in Colombia is going to be a very powerful man, right? Going to be able to have access to everything. So this guy's there. So now they start transporting this newly printed banknotes to the banks. Unfortunately, it's bandit country, of course. So they've got to be armed to the teeth in these trucks that are like, you know, almost indestructible. And they're carrying this money across the country. So, of course, the young bandidos, they decide they're going to rob one of these armored cars. And, of course, you know, they're amateurs, they're kids, right? And, you know, this is about who runs the country. So um, when one of the armored cars gets robbed, they, they have to get, you know, intelligence on where the money is kept. Uh, and they find out that the money from one of these robberies is held in a little house in a village just outside Bogota, and that there's a gang guarding the money. They, f they find this out. I don't know exactly how they did that, but it would be intelligence paying people in the street money to get find out where it is. Um, anyway, so they mount, they decide that they've got to actually tell everybody who's boss. So they mount this serious operation. And they've got these um, Bell Huey sort of Vietnam type helicopters full of guys armed to the teeth, you know. And in the first helicopter is the MI6 agent in his Savile Row suit. <laughs> Sticks out like a sore thumb. And in the second helicopter is this pot pot faced, you know, um, uh, Panamanian fellow who works for the CIA called Noriega. And in the back, they've got these all these armed guys armed to the teeth. And they, they're going to teach these guys a lesson because they can't keep getting their armored cars robbed. Obviously, the whole business would collapse, wouldn't it? Because it's based on trust. So they hit hard. They land in this village. And they really go for it. And they kill everybody. Two people escape. And this is key to the future of the drugs business. Two boys. I say boys. They're sort of grown-ups because of their experience in life. But they're still kids, 16, 17. They escape. Off they go. The rest of them get killed. It's a bloodbath. It's hell. And then the MI6 agent gets out of the helicopter. Is it all clear? It's fine. He goes into the, the house. It's a little house. He has to duck down because he's quite tall for that era. I mean, six foot four now is nothing. But in, you know, in, in the 60s, six foot four in Colombia, where everyone's two foot six, you know, he stood out like a sore thumb. You know, he's got an English suit on, dark glasses. He looked like, it's just incredible. Um, uh, uh, I can show you pictures of them. Um, we should put some pictures on the, on the thing of him because he really did not, he, did, he wasn't very secret. <laughs> But I suppose if you're in disguise, you can be in disguise and not be in disguise. It's kind of, doesn't matter, does it? He, he, he was surrounded in bodyguards. He had all his team with him. And they go into the house to check out. So Noriega and his boys pick up the money. They get the money back. It's big black sacks. Put in a helicopter. And he goes, you might ask how I know all this, because obviously the, the agent becomes my adopted father. So he tells me the story. So um, they go into the back room and... Um, there's um, there's a woman, or what he thinks is a woman, lying on the floor. And um, he told me this story in Madrid, and he was in tears when he told me this story. Because he realized that he had been responsible for what happens to this woman. And he's an Englishman. You know, he's not someone who... You know, we talk, he's old school English, and he's got morals and, you know... Um, so he get he 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 goes up to the woman to see if she's alive. It's a natural instinct, isn't it? She's on the floor, and he. Well, I, I later on when I was older, I asked him about these flashbacks that I had of a woman in a red dress, and he and, and he, eventually he told me what that was about, and this is where this story has come from. It's like even today I wake up with those sort of flashes. They're only little flashes, but then it proves that the brain absorbs information from when you're born to when you die because these things are, you know, in your head. And many of you out there listening to this will realize, will remember, you know, you get these little memories that you can't quite explain. It turns out, I mean, you know, to cut this long story a little bit short, it turns out that the, the woman is a girl and she's... 13, 14, 
And um, it's not a red dress. She's covered in blood and she's bleeding to death. And, you know, this is a guy that with no experience in these sort of things, you know, he's come straight out of Regent Street and he's, he's got all this going on. He's a violent country and he's, he's learning fast. And he sees this happen in front of him and, of course, he feels responsible for it. She's copped a bullet. It's just ricocheted off the wall or something, I don't know. And she's dying. And, you know, in her last breaths, she says, look after my son, Roberto. And in the corner, just over there in the corner, is a, a little boy in a cot. And that's me. And I, I only remember noises and flashbacks. But that's what that was. So as a kid, I must have seen the death of my mother as a girl. But, you know, I, it's, it's really weird because you kind of disassociate from it. It's almost like it was just a movie and not real. But I know it's real because I have these little memories in my head that have nothing to do what, with what I was told. They're just memories. And they've caused me a lot of trouble over the years. Mm -hmm. Mainly the noises, not, not seeing a woman dying because you don't know what it is when you're a little kid. You don't know it's someone dying, do you? You're just someone that you don't even know what's going on. So anyway, that was pretty heavy, so... He feels very bad about this. And um, he takes the boy, puts him in a helicopter. I mean, this is one of those moments in life. What if he just left the boy there? The boy would have died. It's, this is Columbia. This isn't like the NHS come and pick you up and put you in a home or anything. This, this, isn't, this isn't the social workers. No social workers or police. Oh, yes, call the police. and None of that. This is like wild West country. I would have just died. I would have probably just died of dehydration or something, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, he picks this little boy up. You know, I don't know, I'm six months old or something like that. Um, I could stand up, apparently, I was told. I had the strength to stand up. So I must have been about six. I don't know, right? So if, certainly not a year old, but anyway. Um, so... Um, he picks this little kid up and into the helicopter and he will take off, bugger off back to Bogota. Money, job done, everyone's learned their lesson, dead people everywhere, that's going to get out because it's like bongo drums, that's going to get out all over the place. Everyone's going to hear about this. So off they go to Colombia, uh, to Bogota. Uh, it's about 15 minutes in a helicopter. And uh, that little house is very important later on in my story and the significance of it. And that little house, believe it or not, is still there today. Uh, it's extraordinary. Someone sent me a photograph of that house about a year ago. I couldn't believe it. It just freaked me out, I did. Because it's like, what? Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. So I get put in an orphanage in Bogota. And the orphanage is, uh, it's not there now. It's a, it was a church. Now, I think it's a museum now, but it was a church opposite the military hotel so it, it because it's such a violent place all the generals and the colonels and all the people that mattered in the army and that they stayed in they lived in an apart hotel complex called uh, hotel tekendama named after the tekendama falls which is a, like the niagara falls of colombia and this hotel is owned by the military and it turns out that the MI6 agent has an apartment in the hotel, Tekendama, given to him by the Colombian government. And this is key as well to remember later on as Don Pablo Escobar Gavira is dying. And just before he dies, he makes a phone call, right? It's quite well documented. He makes a phone call, which actually is his suicide by cop plan, um, to his son, to his other son, my half-brother, in that apartment. It's pretty weird how things come around in yeah. full circle. Anyway, so uh, going back to this, the, the boy gets taken to an orphanage, which is opposite their apartment, and they're upstairs discussing my, him and his wife what to do with the kid. So that answers your question about how, or how I came to become part of an English family. So what happens is, I mean, you know, I could get into every detail, we'd be here for a week. But the fact is that um, they decide to adopt the child. 
but there are lots of reasons why they decide to adopt the child. Right. Um, uh, uh, it, it, it's, it, it becomes a politic, political thing. But they, with Carlos Escobar and the family situation and the violence that is being perpetrated, they decide to try and take control of this emerging drugs business. Mm -hmm. Because um, uh, someone in their great wisdom has worked out how to turn the coca leaf into a product that you can sell in the shops. <laughs> <laughs> because like you know uh they've decided that uh, they get this great idea and so they get these little factories in the middle of the jungle and they i mean it's disgusting stuff but you put this stuff into your body you're going to kill yourself right they mix it with petrol they mix it with uh carbonates and they mix it with i don't know all sorts of crap and they turn this stuff into some really nasty stuff that gives you blows your brains out mm -hmm. And we know that now as crack cocaine. I had a drug lord on who used to ship gear from Colombia. Yeah. And he was saying they put tires in it. What it, well, it actually causes cancer, rat poison, cement, absolutely, petrol. Yeah, absolutely. But it's madness. So your mum dies. You've been rescued by an MI6 agent. How long did you stay in Colombia for? Oh, so I'm in Colombia until things get dodgy. So probably about 10 years. But we as a family lived in Colombia for another 15 years. So you were none the wiser? You just thought that was my right, so, Yeah. So, 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 I mean, there, there are two sides to this story now. So there's what he's doing as a secret agent with this operation and all that going on. And then there's the memories and the life of this little boy. So why have they got this little boy? What's the deal? You know, well, well, why adopt him? Leave him in the orphanage. Someone will buy him. You know, because in those days, you just went to a third world country like Madonna, didn't you? Buy a kid, right? <laughs> I, know, I use the word buy, but it is. You know, you you pay some money to the to the priest, and he gives you a kid, and you take the kid home, register with the papers in your country. You know, citizen of the United Kingdom, blah blah blah. Change the name, change the date of birth, change everything. Bang, 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 boom. We got a new person, new kid, a little English boy. Right, and this when you've got that kind of power and authority, you can you can do these things in a notary. You just go to the notary, and you know the government lawyer says, "Do this, do this," and they do it. You know, um, so um, the little boy starts growing up in this family in Colombia, where his father, his adopted father, who he, he sees as his father has got his own private army. He's got, um, you know, everybody who's anybody comes to the house. And he's like, his father is Mr. Big, running the whole business. But he has a godfather. Now, in the Catholic world and in, 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 in England, it's, it's probably not, doesn't have the same meaning. But in, 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 a, in a country like Colombia, if you're somebody's godfather, you are somebody's godfather. You are a godfather. And you have the responsibilities of a godfather if your parents die to look after that child and all this sort of stuff. The traditional sense of a godfather. But this guy was also a godfather. He actually was. He was a little guy, pinstripe suit, bowl on his cheek. He looked like the classic godfather, but he was a godfather. And he was, turns out to be, the senior partner in Tomas de la Rue, Transportador de Valores, Sociedad Anonima in Colombia. But he was also my godfather. But this guy was chairman of every single company that operated a business. In. So Texaco, uh, Mobile Oil, um, you name it, whoever it was, he was on the board of directors. And he was the guy that gave these people their licenses to operate in Colombia. So if you wanted to uh, run a uh, whatever business you wanted, if you were, I don't know, um, let's say you were um, Shell Oil and you wanted to operate in Colombia, there's a lot of oil in Colombia, you'd have to see someone like, like um, Don Gregorio, who would then make it happen for you. But you'd have to give him a seat on the board and a share of the company. And so he had a seat on the board of all the big operations, and he had, he had power. This guy had so much power, he could, he could decide who would be president of Colombia. That's how much power this guy had. And he was a multi, he was a billionaire. You know, we hear in Narcos, the, you know, this uh, story about uh, the Americans made about my father, um, that the Pablo Escobar was the richest criminal in the world and all this sort of stuff. Most of that is total crap, okay? Um, yes, he had a hell of a lot of money in his later life when he'd become more successful. 
But, um, you know, that is not true. And we're going to go into all that later. But we've got to a stage now where you've got a little kid growing up in an English family in Colombia. And, you know, uh, I've got bodyguards. I've got maids, servants. Um, you know, I've got everything. I don't go to school yet, but I've got everything I want. And these people that I live with are speaking this weird language. I can only speak to our servants and the bodyguards. These people that I'm living with who, who tell me they love me and the rest of it, they've got this funny broken S Spanish that they speak to me. I don't really understand what they're talking about. And um, they, they, um, they're clearly not part of us because I'm a kid, right? I'm like four, three, four years old, and they're clearly not us. They're f what we, I now know to be foreigners, but obviously at the time you don't know. You just know, no, no. But they're different. They're like really white and they're tall and the rest of us are all short and slightly brown. So, you know, we, we understand that these people are foreigners. But when you're a little kid, you don't see it like that. You just see these people as being a bit different. It's a little bit di tricky. But eventually I, I find out that I've got to learn this other language called English, which is a nightmare to learn. And I grew up with this family, basically, surrounded in bodyguards and this really weird life. But to me, it was normal. I didn't know what money was. I didn't know what uh, uh, needing things were. You just had everything you needed. And, um, you know, some of the richest people in the world would come to our house and, like, uncle this and uncle that. They were just people. So I grew up as quite ex very strange. I look back now as really weird, but at the time when you're a kid, it's normal. Um, you know, I could see the poverty, but I didn't know it was poverty. It was just them, and there was us, you know. And a lot of people that we knew didn't work as such. They didn't have jobs. They were, they, they were gentlemen, they, you know. <laughs> they didn't because work. I know you used to go to school and you had bodyguards with you. Even today, you had two bodyguards with you. Has yeah. that always been <laughs> on with you? Well, I, I, I have. I have a bodyguard, um... If I think I need one somewhere, I mean, I'm going on tour soon in the UK uh, with uh, comedian Jed Stone. Um, we start the tour. It's done in weekly segments and I have security with me all the time. Not because I'm afraid of being assassinated. I mean, someone puts a bullet through your brain and what are you going to do? Nothing. You just, it's the end, no more taxes to pay, right? <laughs> right. But, Doing your favor then. Yeah, <laughs> in a way, you know. Not, not that you want to die, but, you know, it's just the end, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, you know, so the thing is, right, um, the bodyguards are more for, because when you, I don't want to sound big-headed about this, but when you, when you become quite well-known, for some reason people want to do stuff. Like they want to, I don't know, <laughs> they want to, in, invade your life or something or other, which is fine because you're a public figure, you have to accept that. But you need to have someone to help you out in these events where there's like 500 people you need to be a little bit, a little bit careful about. Sometimes you get a few, you know. John Lennon didn't think he needed it, and look what happened. So you've got to be a little bit sensible, but no, I don't feel like I'm in any real danger because I'm not offending anyone. Well, apart from a couple of my half-brothers, but, you know, what the hell. Mm -hmm. We have a continent each, so there's a great big piece of water between us, and that's better like that. <laughs> you so can see cut that bit out. <laughs> see when you're going through it, then like raised from the family, you've got bodyguards with you going to school. It was ever a time you started to question it. Well, not in Colombia, no, because it's just normal. But my, what's quite interesting is I formed a relationship with my ser with my servants. Sounds dreadful thing to say now. But with the people that looked after me, who were paid to look after me, I had a relationship with them. These were my friends. I loved these. I loved my bodyguard, Boundiga. You know, he was like a, like a lovely uncle. And, uh, you know, I loved even more when I saw him in action. Because when I was very, very young, um, I saw some dreadful, dreadful things. I mean, I was in my bedroom as a uh, picture which I want you to show. I was in my bedroom reading one of my Tintin books because I used to travel around the world reading Tintin books because Tintin traveled around the world. It was, I lived in Tintin world. It was fantastic. I think sometimes, I, you know, I still look at some of the Tintin books and think how amazing it was, you know. Of course, a bit taboo, you know, now you can't say some of the things they said then. But I lived in this world where um, I would sit up and read in my room a lot. Uh, and because um, actually... 
when you when you when you grow up in one of these sort of really really rich families, it can be quite lonely because you can't just go out and play in the kit in the street with your mates. That's not going to happen, right? You, you're in this house, so it's almost like you're trapped, like a prison. But you don't know any better, so you don't know. Um, but it's, you got to do things, and we didn't have television, so I read. So I read Tarzan of the Apes, uh, Tintin. I did a lot of drawing and painting and stuff like that. So I'm like, I've jumped a bit, but three or four years old, I start drawing and painting and reading Tintin books. Not properly. I couldn't really read properly, but I'd look at all the pictures and stuff like that. And, you know, um, my bodyguards were my best friends. And, there were, you know, there was a moment. And when the first one I remember was, uh, you know, when you're a kid, you see things so differently to when you're an adult. Because I thought it was amazing, but I can't. <laughs> now I look back and think, shit, that wasn't good. So we're like walking through the street. My adopted mother's got my hand. And I can't be more than, I mean, I'm just walking. I'm not, not very old. And a guy comes up uh, and takes a, a photograph um, with this. He goes like this. So he's got one of these cameras with a great big kind of accordion thing on it. I don't know. It's quite strange. And this flash bulb goes. And he takes a picture. And my, my adopted mother is obviously horrified. I don't know what goes on. But we've, we've got the bodyguards with us. And they shoot this guy in front of me. And I actually remember hearing, more than anything, I remember hearing the gunshot. Because he tries to run away. And um, he runs into a clothing rail. I remember this. We were in the Chico shopping center. And um, there's someone coming out with a clothing rail. And he runs into it. You know what I mean, the clothing rail, it's full of suits or whatever. And he runs into it. And I remember seeing my bodyguard on the right pull his revolver out. And we're in a shopping center. I mean, and the guy runs through the clothes. And as he comes out the other end, wow, in and the noise, you can't believe. Gunshots, really loud. And the noise inside a shopping center, everyone's screaming. Eh, and this guy goes down. It's like in a movie. It's like he literally goes down. And when you're like a young kid, you remember stuff like that. And you, th I, you think it's amazing. Of course it isn't. It's the death of someone. But at the time, when you're a little kid, you think, whoa, it's like drama. It's amazing. So, you know, um, what happens is you become immune to blood, guts, and death. Your mind just, it's like part of life. So, um, uh, you know, later on, I'm in my bedroom reading my Tintin book, and and um, the maid, we had a maid who I really loved, her name was Ortelia, and she came up to the room, and um, she was shaking like a leaf like this in my room, and I've got a photograph of me sat in that bed, which we should put on the uh, thing, with my Leeds United banner on the wall, Leeds <laughs> United, uh, and uh, so I'm a little bit older now, and she comes up to the room, and uh, so it's horrific, really. There's a bloke standing behind her, and he's got a gun to her head. I'm sitting in my room reading my Tintin book. I th my parents must have gone out for the evening. I don't really remember, but they weren't there. So clearly they were now. They were always at social events, and I'm left with the, with the servants. Or oh, I didn't call them servants. They were my people that looked after me. And uh, she's in tears, shaking, and there's a guy there, and he's got bandages. Like, um, you know, like a bandage when you, when you sprain yourself and they, the nurse puts a bandage around, or whatever, I don't know, like that. And there's blood coming out of his somewhere, and the bandage has got blood on it. Anyway, he gets to, he gets to our room, my bedroom, with, with Ortelia, the maid. And she says, you need to come with us. Of course, I don't know, you just do it. I remember this so well. Pardon me. And, um, well, I mean, uh, she's like all clammy and cold. And uh, it's horrible. So we get taken down the stairs because my bedroom was on the second floor get taken down the stairs. I remember the stairs creaking. It's funny how you remember things, isn't it? I remember the floorboards creaking on the stairs. And she's weeping. 
and holding me tight and we go down the stairs and um so the next thing is just extraordinary the next thing you hear is and that's that sound i heard and that was my bodyguard and then the next one bang and this guy just dead that was it and i, I couldn't believe it. i could see the guy on the floor there's blood on the floor. I don't know where it's coming from. And he's dead. That was it. In the hallway in our house. So I'm not sure how this guy gets in, but he's got in. But he gets caught on the way out. And he's shot from behind the maid. Is it a kidnapping? Is it a ransom? Is so it an Escobar it, trying to get you? Like, why were they trying to get you? So then uh, about, I'd say, a short while later, all the sirens, all this crap turns up. And my dad gets out of the car, my adopted father, Pat Wickham, and they all come running in. Because the the front entrance hall has glass windows. So it could see to the street before there's, there's like two doors. You'd see the street. And it all was all going on. All the De La Rue personnel turn up with all their machine guns. And it's all like, yeah, it's like the whole house is surrounded because he's got his own private army. Uh, uh, and it's like, right, that's it. No one's getting in or out. And... Um, a uh, colonel comes in, see me senor, and all the rest of it. And he comes in with all his, um, you know, stuff on him. He looks like, you know, sort of one of these tin pot military dictator colonels with all his gear on, his scrambled eggs on him. He's got all the uniform, right? Nice guy, though. Big moustache like this one. And um, he, he, he comes along and, and um, they start talking. And um, he talks to me. In all, this is all in Spanish. And later on, they tell me that, uh, oh, I have to describe, uh, tell the events and stuff, which is quite difficult for me at the time. But I, when you're a kid, you just, you just say, well, the guy, this and that, you know. And then, um, so it turns out that this was a kidnap attempt. Um, and uh, they find out that this guy has come on orders from someone in Medellin to come and get this boy. And that's that's all they know at that time. And later on, of course, we find out what really was going on, which effectively was um, my real father now becoming a bit of a menace to society and beginning to get a bit of power um, in his, you know, early 20s, late teens. He starts to get quite a lot of authority. And the rise of, of Escobar is 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 sort of documented but not really the very early days are not told and well i want to tell that story here in this in the, in this interview because um in in the uh, in the famous narcos um uh thing that hollywood made you know escobar is 23 or 24 and he's already a you know kingpin threatening the police and running drugs and i don't want to no one really knows what went on in the early days you know we can read about um that that, that he stole um this and he stole that and he was a thief but how does this guy right i know it's a bit random but how does this guy who's a school dropout with not the greatest intelligence in the world uh a violent nasty kid who's got to survive on the street right not approved of by his mother or anybody. Uh, how does this guy become one of, at the time, one of the one of the wealthiest um, drug dealers in the world that's ever lived? Uh, uh, well, we can talk about drug dealers today. But uh, how does he how does he become this person? Uh, and and the answer is, there's no way someone like that could do that. Um, he becomes this person because he's made this person. He's he's been made. The person he was. You know, people forget that Pablo Escobar Gavira did not set up the Medellin cartel. The Medellin cartel was set up by Gustavo Gavira. Now, um, and a couple of other guys who perhaps I don't want to mention right now, but um, uh, so Pablo Emilio Escobar Gavira. So Gavira is his mother's family name, and Escobar is his father's family name. So there's a cousin much older than him. Now, we talk about Escobar Gavira having, what is it they say, that he had 20 billion or 30 billion, or however many billions he had. Escobar Gavira, fine, became very wealthy. But 
his cousin, who was his closest confidant and much older than him, and his idea to set up this cartel, and I explain what a cartel is because a lot of people, don't, they think it's some kind of company or something, and it's not that at all. Um, uh, uh, he, he, they set up this, he set it up, Gavida, and Gavida had a lot more money than him. Uh, um, he was much wealthier. Um, uh, so, so you, you know, I mean, when Gavira, um, well, he, he got basically got beaten up and killed by the police in prison, but that's another story. But, um, you know, when he died, they found billions and billions in different bank accounts all around the world in Switzerland and Gen did parts of Geneva and did parts of Switzerland and America, over 50 bank accounts in America with hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in there belonging to him in his pseudonyms. Um, you know, he was much wealthier than Don Pablo. And he, he, he effectively set up what we call the Medellin cartel. A cartel is a loose affiliation of <laughs> crooks, if you like. Um, and they agreed to work together and, and control a certain business. When did you decide? It, we did, have, we ha it's like the House of Lords, uh, really. House of Lords uh, is a cartel, isn't it? When did you go to the UK? So we got to a stage, well, I was going to get through my stage in Colombia first because my life in Colombia, um, I mean, I went to boarding school in the UK. In, and I, the reason why I remember this is because of decimal currency. So it was 1971. Uh, but before that, my life in Colombia was just an extraordinary life, which, um, you know, I'm going to be talking about live in my tour in the UK um, on stage. But some of the things that happened to me in Colombia are just like unbelievable. They're, they're surreal. I mean, you know, um, an example, um, the president of Colombia used to come and visit me and shower me with gifts. And I'm a little kid. What's that all about? So this is the kind of authority and power. Later on, when I start looking into this, I mean, so I've got to leap forward and back all the time to explain how I know these things. But later on, when I start looking into this as an adult, I realized that the money that was being filtered off the drugs business, and I'll explain what that is as well, some of that money is being used to prop up the presidency. So now we know how uh, the drugs trade is supporting the presidencies of Colombia. I say presidencies because there were more than one president in time that was supported by the drugs business. And there was a little section of my life which became very, very, it was even more, very dangerous. Um, there was a time when, um, uh, and, and I, I don't really understand exactly why this is, but I can, I can sort of uh, use logic. Um, we used to go to a place called Medellin. We used to fly to Medellin. It was really nice because Medellin was much lower and hotter, so it was nice. Colombia was, um, was very high and low. So, you know, in Bogota, it was always about 20 degrees, maybe 15 degrees, whereas in Medellin, it was nice and hot. So I used to like going to Medellin. And we used to go to this hotel in Medellin, the Intercontinental. It's right on the cliff on the side of the mountain overlooking Medellin. And I liked going to Medellin. And we used to go and visit. Um, we used to go to this, this hotel, and we always used to meet these people. And they were, um, what was quite funny was that this guy that I was my godfather used to, we used to sit in this great big room. So I'm telling the story as I saw it as a child. We sit in this great big room with chandeliers, which is a shame because they're not there anymore. But the chandeliers have gone, but the room's still there. And there's a ballroom, basically. And at the end, there was a stage. And on the stage was a platform, uh, a chair, and a group of chairs. And there was a guy sat, a long way away, I couldn't really see who it was. And people would line up to see this guy, right? And like, you know, kiss him like this. and. Uh, giving gifts and stuff. It was like um, Don Corleone movie, you know, it was pretty weird. But Because I don't know what was going on. I just thought, what's going on? They were kids. I used to think, oh, it must be his birthday or something because they're all giving him presents, you know, when you're a kid, you don't. And um, so this is basically um, the swearing of allegiances once a year. And at that time, my real father, Pablo Escobar Garbina, had, um, um, had um, grown from being a common thief to a bodyguard um, guarding um, some of the elites of Medellin. And um, 
Uh, that's quite funny, really, because, um, you know, he'd got to a stage where uh, he, instead of kidnapping people and demanding a ransom, w once he actually kidnapped a very prominent um, uh, politician and businessman in Medellin, and instead of, and when the family paid up, he just took the guy out into the woods and killed him anyway, right? And uh, uh, and this got, and he did this for, for, for a reason. So now people are paying him, right? Not to kidnap them. So he actually hasn't got to do anything. <laughs> they just give him money. <laughs> so they call this bodyguarding, but actually they're paying him not to kidnap. You see, I think he's worked out, it's quite clever in a way. He's worked out that now he's getting paid. It's racketeering, really, isn't it? He's getting paid not to kidnap people. He doesn't get to go and actually do the deed anymore. So he's sitting there, so called bodyguarding with this little gang of ruffians, and he'd be sat at this table. But you've got to remember that they're still relatively inexperienced and they're sort of bandits and um there's a very serious guy there with with thomas de la rue my adopted father with his with all the security guys you know in their uniform and guns and machine guns and, and the rest of it and um they had these belts with bullets on them i used to think that was cool just like the westerns and um so i used to go and sit at this table we used to go now. You go with uh, Baron D and go and see, uh, go and see that, and go and sit over there and talk to um, uh, Uncle. Um, what did they used to call him? I can't remember now. Um, it'll come to me in a second. Uh, I've got to the edge where I forget things sometimes. Anyway, so we we had to go and sit at this table. Nice sit next to this guy who's put his hand around me and give me a big show like that. And um, there were times when he used to say to me, um, you know. He used to say things like, ah, mi hijo, almost like he's showing off in front of his mates. Um, but of course, I had my bodyguards there, 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 and there, and there. So I think there was a situation where he was being allowed to see his boy, but then it was taken off him back. And the grown-ups were just telling him, you can see the kid, but that's it. And that's quite interesting because I used to go also in helicopters to this finca outside Medellin, just a helicopter ride for me and we used to go with um a lot of security a lot of and they'd pick up money from this finca boxes cash i put them in the helicopter and we were off again and i just thought it was great but whilst they were doing that i used to get off the helicopter and go with my bodyguard to sit just in this room in this finca and i would meet another guy and we called him in in my book. We called we gave him an alias. And this is Gustavo Gavira. Okay, so this was the real boss, the guy who 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 was really in charge. He once he got taken out, then Don Pablo became a bit more, and he took charge. But at that time, they were mates, and they ran this business together. But he was sort of in charge. So uh, it's a very interesting time in Colombia, um, uh, but I lived in this in this sort of bubble world where um, I didn't live in the real world. I lived in this bubble so, world. So you were getting to meet Escobar. Yeah. Was he paying to meet you? I don't know. I don't know. What I do know. What we was talking about then? We was having discussions, or was it just for you to be in the room? It was for him to see me, and I was flanked by security. He couldn't touch me. Well, touch me, but he couldn't take me. So I think that um, the British Secret Service were holding me. So you, you get a very strange line between right and wrong. And when you get into these things for real, there's, there's uh, weird because you don't know who's doing who's 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 doing the kidnapping. It's Do quite weird. Yeah, you were getting used then. So of course, yeah. So the, did your parents, yeah, were your step, were your people who my adopted you, father, did they love you, or were you a trophy for yeah? Up and coming this Escobar is, this and is, used as a tool. Yeah, that is the sad reality, I'm afraid. I, I grew later to love my adopted father when, we got, when he was older and I was a big grown-up. And I felt sorry for him in many, many ways. But um, at that time, there's no doubt about it. Um, See, when you were in the orphanage, what, what age did your, your adopted father come and get you? Well, it was only a few months later. So he come and got you and then you yeah. raised you. But yeah. then Escobar used to pay money to see you. Yeah. Well, I don't think it was money. I think there were they had this collaboration. So they would it's get fucking him. weird, Yeah, it? yeah. They would get him to do stuff for him. For, for, so so basically, um 
So let's just go back to what a cartel is. A cartel is a loose affiliation of gangsters that run drugs, stealing, whatever it is they do. So they get together and they sit around a table and they all agree that we're going to do this and we're going to do that and we're going to do the other. No one fucks around with each other. They put this rule, you pay this, I pay that. And everyone. Anyone who fucks around, they get taken out. And it's not like you're fired, like Alan Sugar. It's like you're dead, okay? Um, so it's a sort of more dangerous version of, <laughs> of, of that. So you didn't fuck around, and it wouldn't matter whether you were the boss or not. So there wasn't a boss. This is what, um, there's this kind of, oh, he was the, no. He was the biggest bully boy in the room by the end of it all. But it, there's no boss. There's a group of, an a, affiliation of people who agree to work together and they run their own businesses and they all pay. But you see, what happened was, is the British and the Americans realized that if they gave Pablo Escobar and Gavira, right, the routes to Panama, through Panama to America and nobody else, he would become the richest and most powerful of the cartels, and so they would all have to pay homage to him because he'd be the boss, because he could get all his stuff in and out without getting caught. They used Noriega to do this, okay? And so that's how they made Pablo Escobar a king, right? Because they gave him the roots. Not only they gave him the roots, but they also gave him the means to pay his people. So you just imagine, right? This is what a lot of people forget. He's getting paid in dollars for all this money. It's fucking bundles of it like that. Millions and millions of dollars. What do you do with that? It's just paper. You can't do anything with it. Yeah, because it was estimated they was making over 400 million a week. How, how true yeah, is that? That's too much, but it, it was a lot. But you know how Hollywood just blown off. Yeah, yeah. Then you get people talking and stalking. To, mm -hmm. but I mean, you know, you can imagine, what I, I'm not, I'm not going to get into the nastiness of what cocaine is and that, but you imagine, right, it, cocaine was a lot, a, a, a lot cheaper. Uh, easier to get hold of um, locally, but not not easy to get hold of in America, right? So then they, they the, these people got together and thought, franchise. What we'll do is we'll supply someone over there, Don Corleone or whatever, and Don whatever in 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 LA. He he'll be our man, and we'll supply him with the goods, and he'll pay us. He then organizes gangs in each area and they sell this stuff, and it's flowing through America like water, okay? But there's, you know, every deal that's done, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20. You know, before the end of it, at the end of the week, you've got hundreds and hundreds of millions of these $20 notes, okay? So they just pack them all together, they keep the profit, and they to keep the money, the drugs coming back, they pack it all in the same plane that they <laughs> brought it over in the lorries. Because this plane thing is like peanuts. It's the lorries going through Panama that really did it. And, and they've got these packs of dollars. Used dollar notes. We've got zero numbers on. Proper notes from, from someone who's done and bought some cocaine. So it's like, what do we do with all this shit? It's flying into the sphincters. Uh, it, it's coming back into Medellin. It's coming into this finca in the rainforest, which we used to go and collect these dollars. Pablo Escobar's got to pay his people. Well, they don't want dollars. What are they going to do with dollars? They can wipe their asses with it. That's about all they're good for. They want pesos. Brilliant. We've got them. Dollars? Convert the dollars to pesos. Huh. You need, a, you need a company that's printing the pesos. Oh, Tom Stillaru. So the company and the MI6 agent that is managing director of Transportadora de Valores, Tom Stillaru, this company, right, unbeknownst, I suspect, but I don't know, and that's the scandal of it all. We don't know how much London knew, but what went on was shocking because they facilitated this man's rise to prominence by allowing him to convert a lot of his money, not all of it, as millions and millions of dollars he had to bury in walls because he couldn't do it all. They actually facilitated his rise to prominence on purpose so that they could control the business. Uh, he who controls the money or the debt of a country controls that country. The Americans do it today. That's what Ukraine's all about. 
running up massive debt, then they control the country. When did you start asking the questions about it, or when did it, yeah it start making sense? Where your, your adopted father started telling you things about it. What age were you? Well, yeah. So, that's, you know, these questions are really big questions. You ask me. Um, I, I, I you know, I'll answer that question later. If you ask me that question again in a minute, mm. but I, I still want to get on to this um, this shocking truth about what actually happened in Colombia because we have such violence in, in, in society today. Now it's not just cocaine anymore and there's a, a fentanyl problem and all sorts of other problems. But this whole franchise operation was facilitated by the operation that allowed this gangster to launder and change a lot of his money into pesos. In exchange for that, the British and American security services had control of that country because they had control of the monetary policy, the printing of the money. So they had control of the country. And this was empire building as the, the, the same way they did in Iraq the same way they did in, in many countries. Uh, when the guy gets too big for his boots, they take him out. Yeah, Gaddafi, Saddam yeah. Hussein. Oh, you name them all, right? Now, this is the empire building that's going on. I mean, you know, as soon as, um, unfortunately, as soon as Zelensky outlives his, you know, gone. These, it's the way the, the, these uh, old-fashioned Western uh, ideals work. Do you think these big wigs get used your escobars your saddam of course, Hussein's, then they get killed gaddafi's and yeah. then they, they've built up such a network yeah. where they get killed up, how many of them are still alive built up such a network where they become too powerful because i think gaddafi was wanting to change the currency he was wanting to come away from the dollar you've now you've hit you've hit the nail on the head this is the same in colombia the dollar if you want to change from the main currency the dollar which is where america and Britain, incidentally, they work together on this, control your country, because you control the money, you control the country. There's no other way. There's no, there's no yeah, money money to about. Access to you control the money, you control the country. You, you can decide who's going to be president. You can decide everything. Colombia, the CIA and the Secret Service, the uh, MI6, they had, a, they had Colombia by the balls. Okay, They printed the money, they transported the money, and they also now had in their hands, right, the guy that ran most of the drugs business. So they've got control of the country. They can decide whether Texaco or whether BP get contracts, right? You know, they've got control of this massive country emerging from the third world. They've got control of it. And this is what they do. So to answer your question, yes, get hold of the currency. But if you get someone who decides that they get to a stage where they want to change the currency to pre-war Kuwaiti dinars, that's it, we're not having that. We'll send the troops in. Yeah. Right. So, how? When did you start asking the questions? When did the, the 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 adopted father come forward and and told you everything? Well, it, it, it's it's um it's funny how things happen. So um, we've got it. I mean, I've got so much more to talk yeah, about. We, but we've got to but create. A, a we go. We, uh, so let's take a big gap there, holiday gap there, and go to answer your question. Yeah. So it's now nineteen eighty nine. Just uh, that's a big leap forward, and um, I'm a grown up, and I've got um, I have a wife uh, called Susan, and two little kids, and a stepkid. So there's like three kids, and we're now living. I mean, you know, we've made a massive jump. We're now living on the Costa del Sol in Spain. I'm a resident of Spain. It's 1986, I got my residency. And I'm now designing a golf course, uh, doing the drawings for a golf course, because I'm a drawer, painter. But because I'm a hyper-realist painter, I can draw things as they really are. So before the golf course is built, they got me to do the drawings. They is Peter Alice. The, you know, unfortunately, dear old Peter has died now, but he was a lovely man. I had lots of great, great times with Peter Alice. Now, Peter Alice had, had a little design company called the Peter Alice and Clive Clark Design Team. And, um, the, you know, they got paid piles of money to do golf courses around the world. Uh, best commentator there's ever been, I think, on golf. So anyway, so Peter Alice is down there doing a job for Costain. And Peter Costain, who was the the boss of Costain at the time, 
they'd got paid a load of money from Hong Kong to do this big motorway in the in Hong Kong Harbor with concrete. They're concrete experts. And they got all this money in Gibraltar. So clearly, <laughs> it's the 80s. What do you do? You build a load of houses and hey-ho, all the money gets cleaned. So um, this British company uh, bought 10,000 acres of uh, prime real estate land on the Costa del Sol next to a place called Soto Grande in between Soto Grande and La Línea. And it is a long story how I got there, which we should tell. But anyway, I'm there because you want to know how it is that I found yeah, out about this all shit. connected. So what happens was is that I'm on the Costa del Sol. Great time. Making money. I get paid loads of money to just draw pictures of golf courses. Peter Alice and I get to know Tony Jacklin. We have great fun with, and he and his son and I, we just, we got on fine. And I set up the design business and it's all going well. And they got a wife with kids, dog and everything else. Right. Great life. I mean, you know, I'm making money. It's like really cool. And I'm 23 years old. I'm just a kid, but I'm like, well, yeah, I've got a Mercedes. I've got the lot. Right. And dad, my adopted father, who we you know, I've, we keep in touch. Everything's fine. We're all, we're all, we're all mates and everything. I didn't know him very well. Still, you know, he's he's out there on stuff, doing things. Uh, but I used to go and visit him, and he said he said to me, "Oh, I've got an apartment in Madrid now." Um, you know, come up and see me. I said, "Oh, Madrid, fantastic!" Because the Costa del Sol was like, you know. A dust bowl in those days. I mean, there was the, the shops were shit, you know. So, um, you know, I mean, we used to go to Gibraltar just to get stuff from Marks and Spencers, which is gone, unfortunately. Uh, and um, we were really backward. I mean, oh, I had a brick like this with a phone on it with an aerial like two meters high. <coughs> Hello, can you hear me? <coughs> oh, shit, you know. We lived in the dark ages. Um, no internet, nothing. So you got your newspapers or a bit of Gibraltar TV news, which is like two years old. <laughs> so I'm out there making money, designing golf courses. And, you know, I'm going to see my dad in Madrid and my mother, adopted mother's living in Walton on Thames in Surrey. I don't know what's going on there. I don't th it doesn't seem to me he's like living there most of the time. So I don't know. Who knows? I never got the answer to that one. But anyway, he's in Madrid. And I, you know, I'm living in Spain under my adopted name, Philip Charles Robert Whitcomb. And I used to love phoning up his um, his secretary in Madrid to say, um, oh, can I speak to Mr. Whitcomb, please? And she used to say, who's calling? I say, Mr. Whitcomb. <laughs> she used to think it's some joke. <laughs> anyway, it was brilliant because, uh, so that's now working for Brinks, the security company, Brinks, Delario, Brinks, Welsh Fargo. What's going on here? So, hmm. That's strange. All right. So he's got a new job with Brinks for Rhino. So I'm up in Madrid, do a bit of shopping in the Corte Inglés. Lovely. Proper like city with like modern stuff, you know. <laughs> and one night, um, uh, so so there's several years of a relationship with dad. Quite nice. And um, mother used to fly over to Madrid and then they used to come down to our place in Santa Grande for Christmas. And we used to have a lovely family Christmas. And that sort of thing. So it was going all right. And I'm, you know, I've got the wife and she's pregnant. She's going to have another kid. And it's all like great. So it's, it's 1989 now. And um, phone rings. <coughs> Hello. Hi, son. Um, you need to come to the office quite quickly. We need to have a chat with you. Oh, all right. So, you know, Spain's a big country. I'm going to get on a plane. You know, can't just like go down the road. So up to Malaga Airport, big deal, you know, up to Madrid. And uh, he said, uh, I need to talk to you about something. So I said, all right. And he said, well, let's go out for dinner, sir. All right. So we're just two guys. I'm a grown up now, but I'm, I'm 24. It's 1989. I've got money. I'm doing all right. Good life. Wife, kids, you know, life's cool. And then, you know, my adopted father basically throws a fucking great big hand grenade into my life. And he says, um, now, now what I'm going to tell you, right, it went on over a longer period of time than what it sounds like. So we started a conversation that lasted three and a half years, roughly, maybe four. I can't remember. Now. Well, let's get the dates right in a minute. But basically a fair old time. But this was the culmination 
of his whole life. There's something in his head and he's got to talk to me. Now, something very interesting in, happened in 1989 that you may know about or you may not know about, but I'll tell you anyway. So in Colombia, like the other side of the world, it might as well be on Mars as, as far as I was concerned because I'd finish with all that. In Colombia, on the other side of the world, on another planet far, far away, right, a, a, a hoodlum by the name of Pablo Escobar Gavina, who'd become some big drug lord, had got himself into a lot of trouble. And as you alluded to earlier, had become a bit too big for his boots, and they were trying to cut him down to size. So they had. Now, I don't need to go into his life, but he was the nastiest piece of work you'll ever meet in your life. This is not, you know, We'll go into that in a minute because I don't want people to think that this was like a good guy or anything because no way, right? But anyway, we'll go into that later. Um, so we're in 1989 and we go to see, um, opposite the apartment in Madrid, we, he had an apartment in Calle Goya, number six. Very nice, very, uh, very nice. And um, he was literally living like a bachelor almost. And, and Brinks had an office in Madrid and he was doing stuff, which we will find out about later. Um, so we go to see Full Metal Jacket. You remember the Vietnam War movie? Chocolates, popcorn, lovely. I had a great night. I remember that. Good boys night out. Um, and uh, we're walking home. So it must have been about 20 minute walk. And we're walking past this, well, Madrid's all apartments, isn't it? We're walking down this road, chit-chatting about Christmas, you're coming down, you know, all the rest of it. Because it wasn't, this was, you know, later, 1989. And um, so at the time, this drug lord, or it's not a lord, this, this drug dealer in Colombia had got himself into a lot of trouble. And it, so that he didn't get, I mean, I'm going to cut this long very short, to stop himself getting extradited, he does a deal and ends up allowing, they allow him to go to prison, but he built his own prison, right, which is called the cathedral. And it's like a, a billion-dollar house. And he, it all goes wrong for him because he's an idiot. But, you know, basically he goes to his own prison and lives like a king inside his own prison. But he does lose control of a lot of his business empire. And of course, as I said before, a cartel is a loose affiliation of people. They just like take over his business. So he's lost a lot of control, but he's got some loyal people, henchmen. So he's got Popeye out there killing people still. So, you know, he's like, I think actually, I can't remember now whether it was Popeye or someone else. But anyway, we get on to Popeye later. Um, but he's, he's, he's lost control. He's got himself in a bit of trouble. That's, that's as far as we need to go for now. So I'm now in Madrid, and Dad's telling me stuff. So he's about to tell me something quite extraordinary. We're walking down the road, and he says to me, that's where we keep the money. Well, you know, I'm 24 years old. My whole life is geared up to making as much money as I can. I'm going to be a multi-millionaire and all the rest of it. You can't just tell your boy, that's where we keep the money. What, like, I've got some money coming to me or something? No, no, that's where we keep the money. So <laughs> I, I, I wrote this in a lot of detail in my book because I just thought it was a great story to put in. Some, some stories you just kind of tell loosely, and, but some stories you add a lot of detail to. Anyway, it ends up that um, we, he allows me to come uh, the next morning to go and see this, the way we keep the money. We go into this basement apartment where we'd walk past the next day, the day before, and, uh, well, I mean, I've described it in great detail in my book, but to get down to it, we go down this lift and down into a basement, and it's a bit smells and it's cold and all the rest of it, you know. And uh, we get down there, and there's this piles of money in, in sacks, big, big black sacks. And these sacks, I remember them. I mean, they're really old and knackered, these sacks. But they're the same sacks that they used to use. De La Rue sacks, I'm thinking, Christ. Is this the money? So, yeah. And so he started to explain to me what's going on. So there's this pile of money in Madrid. And we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in big denominations, not little denominations. So they've changed this money over somewhere. 
and it's in big denominations sitting in massive great big black sacks in a basement in Madrid. Ten minutes from our apartment. And he's the only one that knows about it? I don't know. There's no way he could carry these black sacks everywhere. So somebody's helping him. I don't know what's going on. But he tells me that this is the money that they got out of Colombia for a guy who we used to go and see in Medellin. What, the guy that I used to sit at the table? Yes. And that guy there, do you remember we told you we were adopted and you didn't understand at the time? He said, well, you know what adopted means now, yeah? He said, well, that guy there was your real father. And it's just like a bombshell hit. I know. It's incredible just when something hits you and you suddenly realize that this sort of mystical character they used to visit who you used to talk to and you can remember the smell and, you know, this guy turns out to be your dad. Problem is, he's now in trouble. And since we knew him in Colombia, he got married. And he had two other kids and they've had to run away because of death threats, serious problems. So his wife and his two children from his marriage, I, I can't remember, they went to the Caribbean and they went to somebody else and nobody wanted to give them a home. Eventually they did some deal with Argentina and they snuck in there under false names and I don't know what else. But there's a problem with anyone who's his family. And my adopted father is, you know, honorable man and he just decides to tell me all the story and say we need to protect you now so my wife and my two little children in southern grand they live in this great life suddenly special forces bodyguards armed to the teeth turn up at the door <coughs> standing there like bloody whatever she's phoned me up what's going on here are we all uh, uh, i said it's all right it's cool I mean, i'll explain it all when i get back down incredible so he starts to tell me about his life and I start to ask him questions and that's answering your question and that's when I say to him what about the woman in the red dress and that's how it all starts when he starts to tell me about my life so we've gone round now and this is the moment where he tells me about my life and he tells me what this money is this money is money and this is something that you know it's just not out there right? So Pablo Escobar Gavira was not going to be always in this business. He had a plan. I launder several hundred million or whatever it was, and I'll get this secret agent, British agent, to take this money to Madrid, and I'm going to get out of this. That was his plan. But he got cornered, and he had to kill himself in the end. But you know, his original plan was to get out of the business and to set himself up somewhere else. No idea what that was, but this what this money was for. It was his it was his um going away money, <laughs> you know. And he had the MI6 agent. And this was the favor that the MI6 agent did for him in return for the information as to where the cartel, the rest of his businessmen who would have killed him. And there was a woman as well. They were she was the worst. They would have killed him if they'd known he had turned and was working for the Secret Service. Now, even my half brother, who and I, he and I, we don't agree on almost nothing. So Juan, Juan Pablo, but we we agree on basically almost nothing. There's a couple of things we do agree on, and one of them is that our father, right, worked for the Secret Service, eventually, and this is true. I can actually validate this. Pablo Escobar Gavira turned against his cartel and eventually started working for the British Secret Service. In return, I say working for, I mean, it basically, you ask me a question, I'll give you an answer. That's like working for. So he would then tell the uh, British Secret Service gentleman, Pat Wickham, where the money had to be kept. So this culminated in the cartel all their, well, not all their money, but 99% of their money was being held in a bank in Panama. In dollars. Most of it. Like billions and billions and billions and billions and billions. Literally on pallets 
in the Central Bank of Panama. And that money was being held for them by Noriega, who now was the military dictator of Panama. Now, in the annals of history, as you know, the Americans invaded Panama, got their money back. Thank you very much. Mission accomplished. 27 years. <laughs> all right. Mission accomplished. We've got all our money back. They take it back to America. Well, it's all documented. Uh, invasion of Panama. And they take Noriega with them. How much? Somewhere like, somewhere between 30 and 50 billion dollars. See you adopted like father Noria. so your adopted father was he friends with Escobar was that a deal for well that for when him? you are a spy right you become friends with whoever you need to become friends with to get the job done so he has to, his main job is to find out where the hell all his money's going for Good. so to find out where the money is let's say you yeah. know where the money is right mm -hmm. okay let's say you right are hiding 50 euros somewhere in this room Oh, how am I going to find out where you're finding 50 euros, where you're hiding 50 euros? Well, look, I'll tell you what I'll do, right? I say, you give me another 50 euros and I'll hide it for you in the same place. You've got to tell me now where to hide it. So I now know where your hiding place is, right? So that was a very simplistic, childish way of saying, if I want to know where you're hiding your money, I have to get you to trust me. And then you, I have to then get involved in your business to a point so that you then give me some money to hide for you. And that's part of being a, 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 a British Secret Service agent working abroad. You have to get involved in the thing that they're doing so that you can then become part of their operation and then you can then divulge the information, which he eventually did. And then, of course, the Americans got all their money. When you find out all, all that... Like well, you see, you've got to remember, right, that... Um, uh, you know, I'm I'm knocking on the door of sixty now. All right, I'm I'm going to be fifty eight this year, so I'm an older, wiser, been there, done it all, got the t shirt guy. Twenty three, twenty four year old kid, green. Dad tells me this stuff. I don't know. I just thought it's some kind of movie or something. You don't. You don't. It doesn't hit home that it's real. He gave me some paperwork. I'm thinking, mm -hmm, that's interesting, yeah. You know, stuff like that, um, you know. Um, but, you know, there's there's a bit of you that doesn't believe it all. There's a bit of you that thinks, that's just ridiculous. But then you look back, you, say, you sit down and you think, oh, yeah, I remember when that happened. And, oh, yeah, I remember when that happened. And so it starts to cross-reference in the back of your mind. Fuck me, some of this, this might be true. But there's always a bit of you that says, no way. I mean, you know, it's ridiculous. But, there, you know, yeah. Uh, um, sometimes fact is stranger than fiction to a point where it is literally incredible. And in the back of your head, you want, you desperately, I mean, I spent years, this is weird because you think, oh, what is he doing? I spent years trying to disprove in my head the story. But every time I knocked on some door, it opened and then something was true. Yeah, because people watch and they'll think it's fantasy. That, because the thing is as well, I've had a man on called Peter McLeese. Mm, Peter I worked for the SES. Yeah. And they were offered $1 million yeah. to find your father and go and kill him. Yeah, while, it would never have happened. Yeah, but while they'd done that, their helicopter crashed. And Peter was an old man sitting in a chair and people were saying he's telling yeah. lies, he's a fantasist. No. And it was all no, 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 look. You've had someone on your program that says the world is flat, mm -hmm. right? Um, there are people, millions of people have died to try and disprove the Bible stories. You know, hordes of Muslims have tried to kill hordes of Christians and hordes of Christians. These are all, everything is based on books and stories. All the, hum the, the total sum knowledge of humankind comes from stories and uh, that are written in books or on parchment paper or whatever it is, the total sum knowledge of humankind from the first humans to today, it all culminates in stories that people tell of what's happened in their lives. Yes, some are untrue and some are true. It's not that important. You can decide, as you say quite often, you can decide 
whether you believe it or not. You can do your bit of research on Google and you can do your this and you can do that and you can do whatever you want. It's not a problem. I'm telling the story because it's my life, right? If you don't want to believe it, it's fine. Now, this guy <laughs> got slagged off by people saying it's not true and it's the old guy sitting in a chair making it up. Well, I would say to, uh, what was his name? Peter to Peter, Michaelis. good on you, mate. No worries, mate. You don't give a shit about what people think, right? One of the things you must remember, all right, never read your reviews, even if they're good, because it'll affect you mentally for the rest of your life. I mean, you know, I mean, how many people read a lot of their reviews and then killed themselves? It's not good. Yeah. Right? You, need to, you need to just blank yourself away from that. You know, some people believe that we never send some people to the moon. Well, that's great. We don't need to go to war over it. Just relax. It's cool. <laughs> right? It's not a problem. Yeah, I'm exactly the same. This not... is why you're here today, is to yeah. tell things from your side. So seeing you've got all that information, did you know who Escobar was? Well, uh, you see, we've got no internet, right? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> my adopted father, who he's now owned up to being an MI6 secret agent and all the rest of it. But we used to take the piss out of him anyway. I used to say, I reckon you're an MI6 agent. You are. You're, you're James Bond. You're. When Dr. No came out, I went, oh, yeah, that's him, yeah. And he kind of had a little smile in his mouth and we were sort of smirking like that. And I thought, fuck me, he really is a secret agent. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, shit. All right. And then it suddenly dawned that it was real. But we didn't have the internet. So when he says... Don Pablo Escobar Gavira, the world's you know, great drug lord and all the rest of it is in the shit and now we've got to give you bodyguards. I'm thinking, who is this? Because, you know, now, right, and anybody says anything to you, you go, right, Google. Oh, yeah, right? But we didn't have any of that. So when he's telling me this stuff, that all I had was the memories of my childhood. I didn't have all this sort of backup information that I could have access to. You know, I'd have to go to London and get out the old Encyclopedia Britannica, and you know, it wasn't in there, you know. So we didn't have that information. So it, although it was an amazing thing that he was telling me, which I, I trusted him and believed him, and I could see there were bodyguards at the door and the whole thing you know, went mad. Right. But the fact is that I didn't have the information that we all have today. No one had invented Narcos the movie yet or whatever you call it. And the whole thing was not a big story because it was kept secret. There's a 40 year rule with these secret operations. You know, there's, a, a, you know you, there's nothing in the papers, nothing like that. Quite interestingly, if you go to the Thomas Gregg and Sons website, you'll see that there's a period of this time that I'm talking about. It's not nothing in there. It's a gun, mate. It's not, it's all, no one talks about it. It's all like, ooh. You know, it's like no one talks about which member, current member of the royal family used to come out and see us. It must have known what was going on. No one talks about that. That's all like, woo, quiet. Shh, we don't. So the British establishment today, they don't talk about these things. But I know I'm watched. It's quite interesting, isn't it? Yeah. But I'm but now you'll be watched. <laughs> <laughs> you better give me a couple of your fucking but, bodyguards. But yeah, but you know, the, the, this, this guy, what's his name again you're telling me about? Peter McAleese. You know, fair play to him because it takes yeah. a bit of balls to tell the story. Had George like Reeves on as well. He used to fly gear from your, for your dad. Well, he ended up just finishing a 20 stretch in Australia. He's in his 80s. Well, I mean, and he was talking about a woman. Was that the same woman? But she, he said he, she was a fucking nutcase. She killed people in front of him. Of course George. she did. Did I tell you there was a woman in the cartel? Yeah. Right. That so must she be was, her. yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not going to name her now, yeah. but she was worse than him. I mean, I, I went to school. How, I went to school in Colombia with one of my dad's girlfriends. <laughs> Obviously, she was in the senior class, and I'm in a kid's class, right? But, you know, Virginia Vallejo, right, wrote a book about how she was raped by Pablo Escobar. Right. And how she was, um, you know, she turned state's evidence. She's now living in a safe house in Florida. Quite interesting that um, there was a safe house in Florida and it's the same safe house that we used to go to in Boca Raton. Boca Raton is the place. How many kids did your dad actually have? Right. So there, there is a bone of contention here between myself and uh, my half brother. He's grown up thinking he's the one. Now, that's fair enough. I don't have a problem with that. But he's not the one, okay? You're talking about someone who is completely out of control, with more money than ever, who had a penchant for little girls. Now, 
I, you, you, there's a question I'll ask you, right? If you force yourself on a 13 year old girl, what are you? A pedophile or a rapist. Right. So what is Don Pablo Escobar then? He's a pedophile and a rapist. Okay. It saddens me to have to admit that because there are people out there that think he's a hero. He's a mass murderer, responsible personally for at least 5,000 personal deaths, blowing up, I don't know what, killing people all over the place, right? Raping young girls. He raped my mother at 12 and a half, 13, because it's rape if you have sex with a girl like that, because they can't, they don't know what's going on, okay? His wife, uh, uh, Maria, I can't pronounce it, Hanoi, Hano, um, right, uh, uh, Juan, um, um, Juan Pablo's mother, right? Okay, she wrote a book and she puts in there that he raped her when she was 13. And I'll be corrected if it was 14 or whatever, but that she puts that in there, right? All the girls that uh, have had association with him, that have had the balls to stand up and say something about it, have all said they were raped by him when they were, when they were young girls. This guy rapes young girls, raped young girls. We had a thing about it. Okay, now, um, uh, it is it is said by other members of the family that when he was married, he was not going to allow any other children to be born. And this is true. I accept that. Okay. But before he was married, he had this life as a teenager where he went around shagging anything he could find. And he had a thing about young girls. Okay. And he, when he was 16, he got this young girl pregnant as my mother. Okay. And he went on. Now I have in my phone, wherever it is here somewhere, right, I'm in contact on WhatsApp with two, uh, two other kids who I've seen their birth certificates, okay? And one of them contacted me after my book. I can't give his name out, all right? I know you'd like me to, but I can't. One of them contacted me after my book came out and said, oh my God, I remember you coming to see me at the orphanage. And I thought, bloody hell. You know how you write a book and some of this stuff comes out of the woodwork, doesn't it? Lots of stuff have come out of the woodwork. And this kid, because he's, he's younger than me, so he's been fathered by Pablo Escobar, you know, like five, six years later. So it's very close to when he got married, right? And this kid, right, was in an orphanage, because I used to go back to the orphanage where they took me and take presents to the kids. Most of them were blind. I used to go back and take my, so if I got a train set for Christmas, which I, we should put a photograph in there, I used to take the train set I used to play football with them in the yard because they had a tin can they played football with so they could hear it. It was fantastic playing football with the blind kids. They were really good at it. I mean, they were better than me. <laughs> right? uh, but, you know, I just remember that situation and I think to myself, this is not a good person. Just to remember that. Why did you not want to have any more kids? He had this, he had this, he had this image that he had to portray when he was married, right? So he gets married and it's like, I'm a family man, I'm the man. He had, he had got to the stage where he became a megalomaniac. It's like a mental disease. It's Gaddafi had it. Uh, Saddam Hussein, Adolf Hitler had it. You know, they, they start out with these sort of genuine intentions of just becoming the president or the head of this or in charge of that. And then he goes to the head and they start killing everyone, start going mad. Megalomania, right? Stalin was the worst, biggest mass murderer has ever lived to Stalin, right? What is it, 25 million or something he killed? I mean, you've got to remember that once he'd married, he had this image, married man, the rest of it. Why? Because he wanted to become president of Colombia. So he's now using a lot of his money to buy the votes in his local constituency in Medellin. Right? So he's building houses, supporting the football team, and they all think he's like, oh, what a nice guy. He's paying everybody money. And so they all vote for him. Okay? So he gets a seat in the House of Parliament because that didn't last five minutes because someone went, oh, you know, the honorable gentleman's a drug dealer, and then the next minute he has him killed. So we don't have that. So it's like, you know, um, in the House of Commons, you know, it's like um, Richie Shunak, you know, having four members of the Labour Party shot on the way home because they dared to criticize him, <laughs> you know, so you can't have that. So that's, that was the demise of Pablo Escobar when he took on the government like that and started killing politicians. Can't have that. So that was his big downfall. But... 
he had this megalomania thing, you see. So he's got this image to portray family man, kids. Right? And, uh, but he still, when he was married, had affairs with lots of people. And Virginia Vieja was one of them. She wrote a book, they made a film, all the rest of it. It's like, you don't have to come to me for that. You know, you know that happened, right? But I tell you what happened, which is quite interesting, and let's get back on to Popeye. So Popeye was his top draw assassin. He's like head of his uh, killers. And he had like a couple of hundred kids with motorbikes, guns, and they go around killing anyone. They, you, him, that judge over there, kill him. Stop at the lights, bang, dead. 200 euros, uh, dollars, thank you very much, done, right? This guy, Popeye, was in charge of that, and he did some very interesting interviews, um, like ours, but very, from prison. And he's got nothing to lose. He's in prison for the rest of his life, so he tells the story as it is. And he recounted a very interesting story about a group of young girls that Pablo Escobar had him kill. Now, one of these girls was pregnant, with his baby whilst he was married, right? Now, this is a great bone of contention that my half-brother will have a big moan about, well, he can bitch all day if he wants. But the fact is, we're not talking about a nice guy, right? And he's got one of these young girls pregnant and he orders Popeye, his killer, to go out and kill her because he doesn't want any births within the marriage from illegitimate children. There's some image, some Colombian thing, I don't know what it is, right? So he has her killed. And Popeye talks about this in one of his interviews. It's, it's on YouTube. You can look it up. It's all in Spanish, so you'll have to learn Spanish, I guess. But anyway, um, this is not a person that you should look up to. This is a very nasty, uh, you know, evil person. It got megalomania into his head and, and, and thought, right, I'll get into parliament. I need to be voted in. I need to be nice to everyone. So, I'll, so he starts putting a lot of money into the local economy. And that's why he was revered as a hero in, in his, you know, in his funeral, you know, 25, 6, 26,000 people there and all the rest of it, because he bought all these votes with money. And in a poverty stricken third world country, which it was really, third world, I mean, I don't want anyone to be insulted by that, but it wasn't the modern state that it is today. You know, with all this poverty, um, you know, you take, you take a family living in a shack and you give them $500, it's like, whoa, they've won the lottery. And that's what he used to do. So he's bought their loyalty. So when it comes to election day, vote Escobar, vote Escobar. So they're all out voting on this, you know. And, and also he had protection there in Medellin, right? If the police are coming up the road on a raid, it's like all the phone boxes start ringing. So he's like, he's protected. So, so you know, yeah, he had loads of kids. I mean, um, I suspect, um, you know, I mean, I'm, I actually am guessing, right? But it's got to be at least 15. I mean, I've heard from four, of which two I've had verified. So I know that. How were you when you found out he was dead? Did you have any feeling towards well, it? Well, I was sitting. It was funny. I was, well, I mean, 1993. Terrible year. And I'd found out all this stuff. And my we, we'd had to come back to England because my, my wife had a brain tumor. Sorry to hear that. Yeah. Well, we were sat in our villa. Everything's going well. She gets up to the kitchen to go and get a drink. And starts walking around in circles. I thought, fuck me, you've been at the Pims. What's going on with you then? And here I thought if the missus is had a few drinks tonight, we'll be okay. <laughs> and we made a joke about it all. But then she got this massive headache. And we had a, it was one of the first, it was the first brain um, scan, um, CT scan uh, machines they had on the Costa del Sol in Marbella. So I rushed her up there, paid a guy a load of money and jumped the queue and went in. And she had a thing and they found a tumor the size of a tennis ball in her frontal lobe up here. So she said, look, she'll be dead within a week. Wow, that was a shock. So this is nine. <laughs> this is uh, nineteen ninety one, and I remember um, flying back to England. Big panic, kids. The whole drama. It was dreadful. Oh, relocating house again and all the rest of it. Dreadful. Massive problem for me, business wise, and things went really bad. And you know, I got from having lots of money to nothing. So. My life went down the toilet straight away. But, you know, I looked after her and nursed her. There was this thing that you could you could fill in forms, I heard, and um, the government would give you some money to live whilst you're looking after someone so you don't have to work. 
I thought, well, wow, that's quite good. So, the, yeah, I filled these forms in and I got, I don't know what they were paying me, 65 quid a week or something to live on. And uh, some rent for my house and I was looking after my wife and I nursed her until she died. She died in 1993. But in January, and that's a story that I would like, love to get onto, in January, um, uh, my adopted father, when he was talking to me in Madrid, he had a bit of a weird thing going on with his hand. It was a bit kind of withered or something. I don't know what had gone wrong there. So I said, what's wrong with you? And he said, oh, nothing, nothing, nothing. You know, poo poo it all. Anyway, it turns out he's still working in Colombia because it's quite interesting. When I wrote the book, um, I used my collection of postcards as reference. Because when you got a postcard, they're the WhatsApp messages of the day. You, you've got the picture on the front which says where it is. So let's say um, Medellin. On the back, there's a postage stamp with a date and a time. So that's cool. So you know where that person posted that postcard from. Then it says uh, on the postcard, it said, um, oh, um, you remember when we used to go here? Or something like that on it. Signed Papito, which is, he always signed Papito, which is dad. Um, and then there's the address on there. So you've got all this reference material on one postcard. So when you're writing a book and you've got 400 of these, it's like, wow, brilliant. So I know where I was at what time, where I lived and everything. So it's really good reference material. So, you know, we got, we got all that. And um, I've forgotten where I was now. Where was I? Yeah, when your wife get, took away. So, so uh, sorry? When your wife was not well, she had the tumour. And then you met your dad. He was sending postcards. His hand was broke or something. Yeah, so we found out that his, his hand was something wrong with his hand. And... Um, uh, anyway, he went, he went to a hospital called Mount Alvernia in Guildford and they diagnosed him with a thing called motor neuron disease. So I said, where the hell did he get that from? You know, what is it that, that shit? What is that? So it turns out, and this is what I was coming to, it turns out that he's still on operations in Colombia, but a lot of the, um, other members of the cartel had been putting this money in, in stupidly, of course, in a bank called the BCCI. And their headquarters in Karachi. So that's gone to Karachi on some secret mission to bring down BCCI and get information. I don't know what he's doing. But anyway, so this big operation was run from Madrid. And it's the same usual story, armored car service, usual story. But they catch BCCI on the take from the Colombians and it brings the bank down. But when he's in Karachi, he gets um, a disease. And he's in the Dangerous Diseases Clinic in London. And um, I always see the, the funny side to, to a lot of these really tragic stories because it's the best way of dealing with tragedy. But um, he, he, he comes back from Karachi with a sore throat. And he goes to see the doctor at the health center. And the doctor closes the health center down, kicks everyone out, right? And he's got diphtheria. Now, diphtheria hasn't been in the UK since the Dark Ages. And he's brought diphtheria back with him from Karachi. So fuck me, they close it all down and it's a bit like lockdown. Everyone gets locked down. We're getting phone calls every five minutes, you know, what have you. Uh, are you okay, whatever. And he gets put in the dangerous diseases clinic. Then he recovers from this. Uh, it's funny because it was Christmas and Santa threw Christmas presents through the window and wouldn't come in. <laughs> he recovers from this, but the toxins from diphtheria gave him motor neuron disease, which killed him. And But 1993, you see, so... So in January 93, my adopted father, who I've got to know really well, and start, and I loved him, really. I grew to love him yeah. in a different way, but just really nice. Yeah. He was a nice guy, you know? How was it when like, Juan she's, and that, you, when you talk to Juan, like, when, when they talk about, do the, the you feel a disconnect with your half-brothers and half-sisters? Well, my half, no, I have a relationship with other half-brothers and sisters, but my half-brother, Juan Pablo hates me. He just says I'm a liar and a mental case and everything else. It's it's not right. He shouldn't talk to me like that. But he just he just won't he won't have it. So that's fine. He's he's allowed to have his opinion. I I won't speak bad of him. But you know we're in um we're we, you know back to the story. We're 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 in 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 Walton Cottage Hospital in Walton on Thames in Surrey, and Dad's you know he's dying. He's got motor neuron disease. He's got about I don't know a couple of days to live maybe. And I, you know, I'm looking after my wife who's dying. She's down the road. Her mother's there and I go to visit. 
dad in the hospital. And it's horrible. But even in these horrible moments, there's some funny moments. And I always find comedy in all sorts of places. And <laughs> I'm sat on his bed, and he's, he's, in the, he's in this room with Arthur. And he's there. There's a two, two, two beds. And uh, it's, it's morning, and Arthur's going to get his bed bath. And these two little nurses come in. And they draw the curtain, because that's ridiculous. You can hear everything. And they just go, oh, yes, come on, Arthur, we're just going to... And then you hear... <sighs> and these two nurses walk out white as a sheet. So they've obviously gone to wash his nether regions and he's got overexcited and dropped dead. <laughs> <laughs> so me and Dad are laughing. We're kind of trying not to laugh because it's, it's a sad, it's a tragic moment, but it's also funny because you just think to yourself, what way to die, yeah. you know, two young nurses, you know, doing the business. Anyway, so anyway, Arthur dies. And I'm sat on the bed with Dad and I said, I'll come and see you later this evening. All right. And he can't speak properly now. He's a bit, you know, come back later and he's not really not well. And he kind of gestures to me about, you know, and I, I, this is another one of those moments that I describe in a lot of detail in my book because some things really need to be detailed. And this is really key to the, um, we'll have a break in a minute, but this is really key to the next part of my life. It's because you mentioned 93. So. so my wife's there. Don't know how long she's got to live, but she's, she's bedridden. I'm now trying to deal with the issue of this man who I've grown to love who I've realized had led this whole other life, which is pretty amazing. Uh, and then, he, you know, he reaches over and, and asks me to pass him something. You're not quite sure what he wants. And, uh, and then, uh, so I, I think, well, he needs his jacket or something. So he's got this old Dax jacket, you know, the Dax jacket. I love his Dax jacket. And um, he reaches over and I pass him the jacket. And he fumbles because, you know, with motor neuron disease, you can't hold things properly. And he gets his diary out. He's got this little slimline diary, which he kept in. And in there, right, it's got everybody's phone number. I've got that diary. And on one of the pages, it said Escobar. And it's got a phone number. So I've got my dad's phone number on there. I've still got that diary. Um, but this piece of paper falls out of the diary, which I was telling you about earlier. And it's just a home office thing and on the back some numbers and some letters and some dots and stuff so I said like you know and what, what am I supposed to do with this and he kind of goes like that and he's trying to say something and and he comes out with this is where we keep the money so I said what money he said the money in Madrid and then he just goes like that. And the nurses come in and say, you know, leave him alone, let him rest, all that stuff. So I buzz off and come back. Three hours later, he's died. And I'm left with that. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine that? Right? Now, I know that that money in Madrid is a lot of money, oh, life-changing yes. money, right? And he's come out with that. Well, that just blew my brains out, that did. So anyway, I thought, well, I'll put that in my pocket. And um, so we go through the whole. It's funny, when we get to, as you say, when things come out of the woodwork, we get to, um, he was uh, cremated uh, in Cobham in Surrey at the crematorium there. And we're at the crematorium, and there's all the, you know, all the, all of the adopted family there and all the uncles and the whatever. No Colombians, but there's two guys like over there <laughs> in suits like not in black suits just ordinary business suits and they come up to me and they say um is this is it, are you philip so i said oh yes he said um and one of them says to me i've spoken to you on the phone and i went uh, uh, yeah. yeah i spoke to you on the phone when we wanted to speak to your father um you may remember and um we were asking him to go somewhere do you remember that I said, oh, yeah, yeah, that was um, a couple of years ago. He said, yeah, so we're from the firm. And uh, we'd just like to, uh, you know, offer our condolences. And um, here's my card, if there's anything I can do for you. 
or you know if you can you know if we need to speak to you uh, I hope that would be all right all this kind of stuff okay these are two MI6 agents that have come to his funeral <laughs> I'm thinking I've got a business card he goes if there's anything I can do for you what, what am I going to do for these people um, turns out a lot later which will come out later uh, but um, things do come out of the woodwork. So 93 was really shit. So this is January. And uh, he dies. And then that same year, because I'm, I'm answering your question from about three weeks yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, okay. And that same year, um, Sue dies. I was on her, by her bed, at, in her house, holding her hand and she died. It was really horrible. But, you know, it's really amazing to watch the body fight as it's dying. It's a struggle for her. You know, I mean, um, I, I, the, it's at moments like that where you think, ah, yes, at this particular time, it would be good if she could just take a tablet. Yeah, I was the same with my dad. I seen him struggle with leukemia and it just yeah. deteriorated and it kind of messed me up. It because, messes your head yeah, up. Because I know your mental health went, you hurt the bottle and ended up in the psychiatric ward. Like, when did it really take toll? Well, we had some we had some moments there as well, which is quite mm -hmm. funny. But um, no, um, so right, so here we go. So basically, she dies and it was a massive funeral. And I had the uh, ashes delivered to the house and we were going to take the ashes up to Stoke Poges Church in Stoke Poges, the other side of Slough, where we got married. I thought that would be a nice thing to do. So I rang the vicar up and said, I'd like to bury my wife, myself. I thought, it's like, I'm going to do this. So uh, the ashes, I rang up the funeral pile and I said, for fuck's sake, don't deliver the ashes till Friday morning because I don't want them in the house. The bloke turns up on Thursday afternoon. So we've got this box of ashes on the dining room table and me and the two kids are like upstairs going, thinking we're going to get haunted or something. But uh, we went up to the church the next day and put her in a hole, buried her myself with the two kids, said a little prayer and all the rest of it. And she's there today, her ashes are. And um, yeah. Is that when you started hitting the drink, or was it later on? Uh, so, so I'm like, I'm drinking, but I'm not a, a total piss head, but I'm drinking. I would say like a, a couple of drinks in the evening, you know, sit down, watch the telly kind of drinking. Bit of Saturday night piss up with your mates, but I'm not saying that I've got a problem yet in my head. And then... I'm watching the news, December the 2nd, I think it was, just before Christmas, on my own, I'm watching the news. Fuck me, that's the bloke that my dad said, and my whole life went round in circles in my head, and it was on the news that he'd been shot. Of course, later I found out that he'd killed himself, but it was on the news. I'm thinking, shit. So my dad's died, my wife's died, and now that guy who I thought I might be able to get in touch with, because I had these ideas, these stupid ideas, like, all right, now he's dead, I'll get in touch with my real dad. It's like, he's now dead. But not only has he died, he's been shot by the police. So that's what came over in the newsreel, that he'd been shot by special forces or some crap like that. Um, he had been shot, but he wasn't killed by them. So... Um, Suddenly, you know, this whole life starts to, it grinds down and it, and your whole life just becomes a slow motion of nothingness. It's like your brain is like wound down. And nothing outside in the world exists anymore. It's gone. The only person in my family, apart from my two kids, who are just kids, so you don't have an adult relationship with, with my adopted mother, who was a racist cow and I didn't like her at all. So I'm like, <laughs> well, she fucking was. <laughs> I can't, I mean, there's no, there's, we don't need, racism is just not necessary. What's, what? I mean, you look, 
we're all the same. We all get up in the morning and have an orange juice and have a shit or whatever. And we do all, we're just, we're different, but we're the same. We're all human beings. It's irrelevant what color we are. And this, this, she was not nice about that. So I didn't like that at all. So I didn't like it. I, like, I took it up with her as well. I mean, I used to have a few ding dongs with her about that. Uh, but, you know, suddenly there's, my whole life went into this weird slow motion thing. Because I didn't know what was going on, but it turns out I'm going into depression. And where when when you get deeply depressed, you don't really know what's going on. Around. You become disassociated with the real world. It's like <laughs> nothing's really happening. It's like you know there could be a war and it wouldn't matter. You wouldn't know. But you go through the motions of functioning. You know, school run, mm -mm, cook the dinner, mm -mm, clean the house, get on with it. But you know, you're pissed. <laughs> you don't know. You just like. And I was drinking. I mean. A really serious amount of drink. I had to drink to stay sober. I was that pissed. Driving as well. Fucking hell, terrible. I got, you know, got into trouble for that later, but, you know, we all pay for our sins in the end. Um, I don't know how I survived. I really don't. An angel from, the hand of an angel came and must have held me there for a while because I needed help and, you know, I did my best, basically, <laughs> to do myself in, and I'm still here today, so mental health. But we had some, uh, you know, I, I decided that I was going to see a psychologist or whatever you call these people, psychiatrist, that's it. And I actually had a good relationship with this psychiatrist. He was a nice guy, very senior guy, you know, older than me, and he's a nice guy. And he said, Let, why don't you have a couple of weeks off? Come and, um, you know, come to our hospital, have a couple of weeks off, and we'll look after you. So I had the kids looked after, and... I spent a couple of weeks on this ward. Well, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't wait to get out of there. I sat, first day I sat next to him guy. I said, hello, mate, what's your name? He said, my name's Pete. And I said, so what are you in for? He said, well, I'll try to kill my parents with an ax. <laughs> I thought, oh my God, I need to get out of here. Because I didn't, you see, one of the things about depression is you don't see yourself as a depressed person. You just think you're normal. So I thought to myself, I don't, I'm not, I'm not ill. I need to get out of here. It took me quite a while to get out of there, a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. and I got out of there and made, I made, I vowed to get myself together. See, talking about someone with this great life, I'm now cleaning cars and cleaning windows to make a few quid. So I've got brought down a few pegs there, mm -hmm. <laughs> but these things teach you a lesson in life. You know? Yeah, that's where you grow. I think that like when you hit rock bottom, if you especially if you've lost the love of your life, especially if you've hit the bottom, you've ended up in depression, and then you make the changes because you're off the booze now over twenty mm. years. Oh yeah, fair yeah, play. Yeah. How did Escobar actually die? Well, um, so he it's it's well known, and and my adopted father told me that you know the man will never be caught. He will go down. He's you know he's the mad Colombian. He won't be caught. And Colombians, some Colombians, old school Colombians tend to be a bit, you know. <laughs> Nuts. <laughs> yeah, I've still got that in me, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I'm not afraid of death. It was quite extraordinary. I mean, I should be, but I'm not. I think it's because I think what happens is you see so much death and you see so much stuff. It's a bit like coming back from a war zone, I would imagine. That you you become in you you indoctrinated so much into what went on that you just you don't you. It's like someone threatens you, you go, yeah, man, what are you going to do about it? And you know, it's like not a problem. So I just think that, um, I don't know, it's difficult to, difficult to explain, really. But, um, yeah, they ask about their thing. Yeah, I know, but it's I'm different, difficult to explain, really, he, the, what he didn't want. He, what I'm trying to explain is the humiliation because it's a lot of pride involved. So he was never going to allow the Americans to extradite, extradite him like Noriega. He was not going to have that. I'd rather die. Um, he was never going to be arrested and allow people to, you know, put him in prison and be one of the other twats that had been in prison. He wasn't going to have that. So, you know, he got cornered like Saddam Hussein. In the end, they found him in a hole. Mm -hmm. Well, with him, you know, he, he there was no way out. So... I mean, you know, he, he was, he, although he was, you know, a little bit uh, academically was thick, he was, he was a survivor. He knew how to survive. So even you and I know that if you make a mobile phone call or you make a phone call of any sort, you can be tracked. And he knew this. 
So he's he's come to the end of his tether. He's fucked, you know, basically. And so he gets himself tracked. He kn he knew this. He, so he phones up his family, um, and you know, they track him down, and you know, they gun him down. But he's not dead. But um, there's no way he was going to be taken to hospital or any of that nonsense. So he, he puts um, gets his thirty eight straight through the level. Because he's been gunned down, he's been hit several places, and you know they hit him in 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 other places on purpose. They wanted to take him alive, but he shot himself. And it's quite interesting. One of the guys that was there that said, "Oh yeah, I'm the one that killed Escobar." All this bullshit. He went to prison in the end. Yeah, he's a twat, wasn't he? So, what hey. do you think talking about your life and about all that? How mad it is! Like people can watch this and make their own assumptions. It's your yeah, story, it's fine. but what do you think about? The whole madness it is mad. of it. it is mad. It's fucking nuts, it is mate. nuts, yeah. But, it's, but nuts. It's, it's even more nuts in a way because I've since discovered that my adopted father was a totally different person to the person I thought he was. You know, I've met members of um, MI6. I've met members of the SA. You know, a guy from Hereford contacted me. He said to me, oh, my father used to work with your dad, and I, he was in the SAS, la, 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 la. You get all these stories come out, you think, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it all kind of like interlocks. Well, it was quite interesting. So although you think it's mad, you know, it's like, well, it's not that mad. Actually, it's true. And then you realize that this is a huge story of sort of empire building and meddling in the affairs of a local country. And then and you start to realize this amazing stuff. And then on top of that, you've got a situation where you know that somewhere out there in the world, there's like a billion dollars, which is yours, that your adopted father and your real father were tucking away together, your two fathers, if you like. I'm the guy with two fathers. And like, that's your money. Well, now you know why my real family don't want to acknowledge my existence because they want they want to own the IP rights to Don Pablo Escobar Gavira, IP rights, intellectual property. There's a huge problem with Netflix and, you know, two guys from Netflix went down to do some reconnaissance before they made the, 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 the Escobar story and they got killed. Oh, yeah, mate, it's no, it's no joke. You know, you don't just go up, rock up to Cundinamarca and go, hi, man, you know, we're going to do it. You know, this is Colombia. It's not. Uh, it's not. Um, it's not sunny Surrey. You know, it's not Guildford and Godalming. Do you think Escobar still get that sort of pull? Even the things that you're saying today, could that ever come back and you end up winning in that? Well, I'm not going to Colombia, am I? So it's not a problem. I mean, we're talking about um, this. This. I, I. I did actually look. You know, when I was writing the book, I. Had some a good friend of mine said, what are you doing that for? You're going to get killed. So, you know, I thought, right, two things, right? A, I'm not actually, you know, I'm not inculcating anybody that hasn't already been inculcated into the business. They already, you know, everybody knows who everybody is. So it's like, I'm not saying anything that's different in that sense. Um, I may be uh, creating a situation where, you know, members of the royal family or members of the British establishment may get the hump about what I've got to say. De La Rue haven't said a lot, nice and quiet. They keep, that's their job, keep quiet. They haven't said much because they know what I'm talking about is the truth. Uh, and um, so, you know, what you, you, the, the Escobar family just doesn't exist anymore. There's uh, Juan Pablo and two other kids that I know of running around. Um, he's making millions out of the, the, this and that and the other. Um, all the others have written books. Popeye's dead. And he is the one you, you would have been fantastic to meet with. I really wanted to meet him. Uh, uh, Gustavo, unfortunately, has died, you know. And um, so, you know, the, the, the lawyers, is the lawyer who looked at the book, you know, because you have a legal read. She said, well, you know, most people have written about it dead, so don't worry about it. And you haven't actually, you know, I haven't slagged anybody off in the book. You know, Escobar Gavira was not a nice person. He was a drug lord. He wasn't really a lord. He was a drug dealer. Uh, he was manipulated by the British Secret Service on the specific instructions of members much higher up than him. And he was doing a job. Right? It's hugely controversial, and we've got a lot more to reveal in the documentary series than we're going to reveal today. Yeah. Roberto, where can people buy your book? And you can get can, that on Amazon. And where can people get your tickets for your tour? Yeah, so the tour is being done in slots. 
you know, like yeah. a week and a week and a week and a week. Mm. So there's an April tour. Um, and in April, I'm looking it up because I can't remember what the hell. So um, in April, I'm going to be in... Uh, so they're doing, um, they're, it's quite interesting that um, dad was from, he was a Yorkshireman, really, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. My adopted father. And I'm actually doing Yorkshire. So, you know, for example, um, the Tuesday, April the 4th, I'll be at the Gorilla Bar in Doncaster. So, you know, and you can get tickets at, um, um, it's all over Facebook. And I'll that. leave the link in the description anyway for people to get it. Yeah, you can do that, can't yeah. you? Because I'll send that stuff. Yeah, you send us a link. We'll put it in yeah. the description for people to come and yeah. get tickets. So to what come I'll do you. is I'll send you um, venues and stuff mm -hmm. um, for you to add. Yeah. Um, but there's um, six venues at the first uh, tour. And then um, in July, there's going to be mu much bigger venues. Um, so theatres and with mm -hmm. you know uh and i'll be signing books and um all the rest of it because they they've got well, this book here they've got at the shows mm -hmm. and you you know if you i don't know how they do it but there's a yeah. promotion company called omega promotions and you can buy my tickets on skiddle uh and so you just look up go to skiddle look up roberto sendoya escobar and you'll get um all the venues yeah. there and all that sort of stuff but i'll send you links yeah just before we finish up roberto i know you're a man who struggled with mental health and been through it and came out the other end for anybody that's watching it's maybe in this struggle just now what advice would you have for them well there are a couple of things you need to do um one you must absolutely come to terms with what's happened Right, don't get into denial about it all. And you can only sometimes do that if you talk to other people. I mean, I found some professionals a bit patronizing, which annoyed me. Oh, really? How sad is that? You know, I don't need that. But, you know, talk to someone, your best friend or whatever it is, about what's going on, because you may not realize you're depressed. But you must always also, and I know this sounds a bit sort of um, callous, but you must always laugh about things find the funny side to things because there's some really tragic things that happen but there are also some funny sides to this sort of thing you know like and when the nurse said to me um that um, i'm afraid your father's now he's dead he's gone to heaven and i said oh okay um so i don't know why i said this but i said so um how long does it take to get to heaven <laughs> and she turned around and said about three and a half hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I just thought to myself, love it. Absolutely yeah. brilliant. So you must see the funny side to all the tragedies because, and there always is a funny side. You know, I was at a funeral where I walked, I backed off by accident at something and knocked a vase over and the water went all over the bloody thing. And it's just funny, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, you, you must see the funny side to life and laugh about it because laughing is great therapy. Yeah. But, you know, get help. I promise you I wouldn't be here today if I hadn't got help because, you know, at the end of the day, it's, um, it's suicide territory. Yeah. You know, you just you can't deal with it. So you, and the thing is, right, you don't know you're depressed. You think you're fine. Mm -hmm. You, you, the person, you're just doing crazy things, but you don't know that that's depression. And that's the problem when you don't know. When you're actually sat there going, I don't feel, that's not depression. Yeah. When you're depressed, you'll, you might well be actually really, you know, elated and happy about yeah. life, but you might be depressed. And so yeah, um, there's a combination of that. Now, if you are in my position where you may well be relatively well known by in a, as in a public way, right, you're going to get people that slag you off. You're going to get people that say you're full of shit. You're going to get people that call you a liar. Uh, Caroline Flack, poor girl. I mean, a beautiful young lady with a whole life ahead of her. And she read her reviews. Yeah. And what happened? Yeah, it's all about She that. killed herself. Mm -hmm. Right. So don't worry about what other people talk about behind your back, what they say about you. Because the world is full of very nasty people right? They're just going to say stuff. Don't worry about it. Just even, don't even listen to it. Ignore it. It's irrelevant. Okay? So that's, that's important. Roberto, 
for coming on and doing telling your story. I thoroughly enjoyed that. Well, that Good we, luck with the tour. I know we've only scratched the surface because you've you're keeping a lot of this stuff for your tour, but you're coming back on again and it'll reveal a lot more and we've got a lot of things in the pipeline yeah. to talk about. So I wish you all the best for the future. Have a great tour and I'll see you soon. Hasta luego, amigo. Hasta luego, amigo. <laughs> <laughs> you nearly said hasta la vista, didn't you? <laughs> Baby. <laughs>